cleaning. Now you might see there's a mic there and a mic here, but don't worry, it won't be like, like watching Wimbledon. I'm just thinking that up. I'm doing a starting song and a closing song. Now, uh, not long ago, uh, Claire asked me if I wanted to uh, write something about uh, King Street for the Heritage Programme. And uh, I wrote quite a lot of poetry in my time, songs and that. So I did, uh, I did a set of short stories and memoirs and about 15 poems, 15 short stories. It's looking out about that, that level. Uh, some uh, along the, like the Battle of Faggy Lane, which is about 3,000 words, but you know, it's it, hopefully it's all going to be published shortly and uh, everybody can purchase a copy and the profits will, will go to our wonderful society. So, this is it. Right, you've, uh, you've seen this before. James Lawler Booth. He, like he said, he had a horrendous childhood. Poverty, deprivation, illness, abuse, a frightening environment, target, targeted by his parents in the alcohol-induced tem tempers, really neglected, and it's amazing that a kid like that who was running feral, ran away to London, got a job, so, sorry, Wigan, and not much difference. <laughs> and uh, he actually, got a roof over his head and started singing on the street and developing a stage act. And he went from that to performing for the King of Buckingham Palace. He was um, top, top, him and Mary Lloyd were the, were the top uh, drawers on the uh, old musical circuit. And, uh, but his neglect, it caused really bad problems uh, with his bronchitis. He even put it in the stage act Coughing better, it's not the cough that carries you off, the cough they carry off in an hour. And uh, he died, collapsed on stage, never recovered, and died in 1921. And then his young lad took over the reins. So we're going to start off this with a tribute to our very own Wigan Mountain Day, and it's a, a song called John Willie's Ragtime Band. Goes back to about 1895, this one. Talk about your ragtime brass bands, your cigar bands, and your rap bands. Well, we've a band, it's all the sway. A little band, don't know where we Well, talk about your ragtime trombones, and your fish bones, and your wish bones. But when you've all done the blow, when you can hold your breath, we've got all the other fellas skinned to death, cause I've skinned them all myself. And it's up, oh, John Willie's ragtime band. Oh, oh, John Willie's ragtime band. And heroes, when we play on Wigan Pier, and mill girls flock around and give a cheer, and the colliers, they shout by go myria. It's chiku, it's chiku, it's chiku one. We dress just like the Oscars blue. And we've won goat cups and saucers too. Well, in Bolton now they do it grand. They up grown with black puddings in the rand. When they hear, when they hear John Willis ragtime band, baby dear, listen here. Oh, oh, John Willis ragtime band, what a mob when we're out upon the job. Oh, oh. John Willie's a ragtime band And when we play all the people fade away Heroes when we play on Wigan Pier And the mill girls flock around and give a cheer And the colliers they shout by gum area It's chiku, it's chiku, a miser beer And we dress just like the Oscars blue With leather togs and a purr and obvious clogs We've won gold cups and saucers too Make no mistake of where the lads to take the cake in Bolton now they know a lot With a cow wheel in the ram They can do the turkey trot When they hear John Willie's ragtime band Baby dear, listen here Thank you Well the first one we're going to do Is a poem Now I uh, model this poem 
on a very famous old Lancashire uh, poem written by Sam Laycock, and that was in 1865. And it's called Boatner's Yard, and it's about a yard in uh, in uh, Ashton the Line. And it starts at number one in Boatner's Yard, my granny keeps a scoon. So I thought, I need to do this about King Street. And uh, this is what I wrote, anyway. It's, uh, it's called A Trip Down Old King Street. You walk into Old King Street by the posh in Arthur Hotel. But if you won't go in though, you have to be a swell. There's carriage at its stable and the top seat in the drum. When you peep into the public bar, it's like an old boys club. And across the road at 23, there lives the Rootcroft clan. Mr. Rootcroft's an eminent surgeon and a fine gentleman. It does operations at dispensary for the poor and for the old. It does them to number 23, if it's key for you, you can afford. Now, number 20 is a handy place if you've broken the law. Like breaking the rules of your lease or breaking somebody's job. It's Richard Lee's solicitors. He will defend you well, but if you lose and you cannot pay him, you'll end up in a cell. The next is Grimes if you are a kid. They have a lovely store. They sell everything from pianos to fiddles and banjos. They even give you lessons if you don't know how to play. The tunes that filter out of there will brighten up your day. Then there's a bicycle shop at 28. Owned by Mr. Timberlake. They've got rights, trikes, penny farthings. Of them you can take a pick. Wobbling down the cobbles is painful, yes, of course. But it's cheaper for the likes of us who can't afford an horse. <laughs> Next, I <hang> know. <laughs> I'm not going to say that, so I've changed my paper over. The next is Victoria Buildings with its restaurant of the best. They've christened it the Oyster Room, after London's finest. Now they've changed the name again. They come from near and far, to wine and dine in perfect style in the Silver Oyster Bar. At number 34 is Hilton's Boots and Fine Shoes for the Ladies. I don't think Mr Hilton knew what fit men get for wages. Real leather though, and to think of it, they look good for the price. I think if I bought her probably some, she'd treat me really nice. At number 35, John Wilcox on the pawn shop and does auctions. He's always plenty to auction off from his not collecting collections. The poor come in to pawn their goods, they'll never get them back. But that's the way of the world round here, and you can't blame George for that. Then it's the Royal Court Theatre. It's not that long been built. It's round as out, palatial, and it's trimmed with brass and gilt. They had 3,000 in the other night, and the show's there a treat. With a palace like the Royal Court, it really is King Street. Well, now I must be leaving you. I must be on my way. Places to go, people to see. Too few I was in a day. I must bid a fond farewell to you. It has been nice to meet. We will meet again, and I'll show to you the rest of all King Street. Thank you. Uh, the next is a short story. Which uh, a verse in uh, in a Lancashire folk song inspired me to this because I wanted to do something what incorporated the horrific industrial diseases what we have in in Wigan through mining and cotton and stuff like that and uh, and a a verse in in, in a old folk song. Uh, what other the comic comic aspect of it? Give me the inspiration, and it's called Kissing the Shuttle. Now, if anybody don't, don't know what Kissing the Shuttle is, this is one I prepared earlier. And what they have to do every few minutes, depending on size of weave, it could have been ten minutes, could have been five. You have to knock the spindle down, fit a cop or bobbin, depending on which side you come from. And then you, you get the end and you thread it in and then you have to suck it through like that. Then grab all of it with your teeth and pull it through. 
which is all well and good. Then he pulls it, pulls a bit extra, put it back on track, tie it up, and start, start weaving again. But like it says though, the weft contain poisons to kill rats, mice and cockroaches. It also contain lubricants to stop the weft snagging. Cause it horrendous diseases such as oral cancers, lung disease, and cotton fibre, and the cotton fibres cause bisonosis or weaver's brain lung. And when the girls started wearing lipstick in the 1900s, the shuttle was never being cleaned. They were a vehicle for scarlet fever. So just kissing the shuttle to, to set the loom in motion could cause death. So I wanted to, to get some comedy in a Lancashire vein and get the, uh, get the point over. Um, invent some real people and maybe give it a happy ending. So let's see how it goes. Matilda Toppin plopped in for a shift at Eckersley's Mill. She was a weaver. This meant she could be kissing the shuttle that's loading a robin and sucking the weft through the shuttle every few minutes. This could cause health problems. Tackler Albert Thurgluff, sort of maintenance engineer, walked up to her. He'd been pestering her for a fortnight to be his girlfriend. Hey, up, love. You're looking lovely today. Have you dressed up specially for me? Why would I dress up for you? I've just got my normal work tackle on. I won't mind tackling, they would tackle the turn. <laughs> They're a really pretty wench. You'll not get your flaming on it, oily hands on my tackling them or you're an idiot. Now toddle off or cloth the weave. Albert had only been gone a couple of minutes when the shuttle left the track. Matilda just looked in time as the shuttle flew through the air, missing her by inches. She went to Albert's bench. Where the bloody hell are these shuttles coming from Albert? That's the third one that's cracked and snagged the cotton and flew out. It nearly took me head off. If you take up with me, love, I could wish it for Dory up and keep you. No more working here. You know how many times you have to kiss that shuttle and all that muck what's in the weft? It, it won't be long before your teeth are gone and your gums rot to worse. That's right, Albert. Fill a girl with confidence. If you were my Matilda, I would make a patented thing of it for sucking up your weft and you could keep your teeth and gums in fettle. Luke Albert, just give us five shuffles, preferably bait loaded. Here, Matilda, have these. You won't be kissing the shuffle today. May I have lunch with you? You can mock you off, Albert. What the pie I paid for it with wages in the Eckersley canteen? It would have to be the Savoy in Manchester to turn my head. What about the Savoy chip in Oak Street? <laughs> you have no chance to type this in song. After lunch, she was on the pearl again. If they had a Jack Russell when there was one on eat, and he'd probably less chance of performing. <laughs> Making an art of a form of moidering was Albert's forte, and it wasn't long before I was at it again. <laughs> I'm free tonight if you've nothing on the giggle. I didn't mean it like that. It's an old time sing along at the road makers in Queen Street. I'm washing my hair tonight, then I'm listening to Frankie Vaughan on Wireless. Matilda, listen, lass. I cannot bear to see you kissing shuttles all your life. So if I was to ask you, would you come and be my wife? Well, that was very poetical, Albert. So here's another poetical gem. I'll thank you for your offer, which I sadly must decline, because I'd rather kiss a shuttle than kiss a face like that. <laughs> Albert seemed to have got the message. He puffed and panted and glowed at Matilda. Then he went more to Nelly Hartwright and finish up. <laughs> I see you've managed to get shut of the old beggar Matilda. Aye, it took some doing. Sorry, I'll jump. Young Jimmy all came over. It was a junior clerk in the office. Handsome lad in his early twenties. He was intelligent and from a good family. They met a few times after work. I see you've managed to get shut of the old beggar Matilda. Aye, it did some doing too. Talk is it's tormenting Nelly Hartwright as well, who will ask. Any road, I've told my mum we've seen each other. And if she likes to look at you, she might fix up a position in Coops and Downing Street. I don't start better conditions than here. That would be nice. I was still going dancing at court hall, didn't I? Yes, love. But first you're going, you're coming for your tea at our house. We're in Sharp Street. I know your house in Great George Street. It's Saturday and we're done at 12, so I'll walk you home and we'll make it mad with your dad. Changing paper again, don't clap. <laughs> it's not that difficult. There we go. 
Hey, Sharp Street's a bit posh, isn't it, Great George Street? Will she not look down on me, Jimmy? As soon as she sees you, Matilda, she'll love you. Jimmy picked up Matilda as promised. She enjoyed the best tea she had for ages, and it went really well. Matilda and Mrs. All go on like house on fire. As they were leaving for King Street and the Thorpe Tall, Mrs. All said, Matilda, love, I will get you fixed up at Coots. You're an ugly girl, rather than have a nasty demeanour. You won't be kissing that bloody shuttle for long. How will a weaver like you? I managed to get out and tell them where to stick the shuttles. It's not that bad, Mrs. All. Oh, yes, it is, love. My two best mates both died. One of throat cancer, the other with very long disease. My mother died with very long. I know, love, she was my best mate. I hope you and I do do all right and make a go of it. Some do, some do, don't. But if you don't, I will have fulfilled the promise to me mate to look out for you. And if you do, you'll be the daughter and the rock. I'm getting a lot of real to me. <laughs> look at us both, Matilda. Matilda hugged Mrs. Doll, and quite a few tears flowed. A lot of Matilda's repressed emotions came out. Like, look at us both, Matilda. Don't look aside in your spoiling miracle. I'm sorry, Mrs. Doll. I didn't get much chance to moan when we were looking after my dad and brother. Well, we'll heal the stars together, love. Now you get your war paint on and go to the court hall. You're wasting dancing time. And my name's Amelia, not Mrs. Thanks for everything, Amelia. I can't believe today. Go and enjoy yourself, love. And make sure she gets home at the appointed time or I'll have your guts for garden to give you all. Thank you. <laughs> This is called Elvis at the County Place. They didn't play them. <laughs> now that they did play at the uh, court to the Hippodrome. I think it was a bit feasible sticks in the It's a tale of two nine-year-olds thinking they're going watching the guns and have her own at the ABC. <laughs> then they're dragged by their big sisters to watch Elvis in blue Hawaii at the county players. The, the year is 1963. I know, because I was one of them nine-year-olds. And it actually happened. And it's written in the mindset and um, the mannerisms of a nine-year-old. I, I hope I've got it right. I can remember it like it was yesterday. My mum and my auntie Edna were both working. My mum had left some money on the sideboard and said to her Margaret, you can take her Kent of pictures. Her Jack and Carol are going as well. Your dad's picking them up before he goes to work. They arrived an hour later with meat and prayer to pass for dinner. Me and her Jack were proper excited because the ABC pictures, the guns and have her own were on. Me and her Jack were looking forward to that film because it was a war film. We loved Japs and English and all that tackle, but when we got into Wigan, our big sisters dragged us to the county players on King Street to watch Elvis in Blue Hawaii. Me and I, Jack, he, with faces like two slap bottoms, I'm not sure I said, but I'm being pushed today. I'm sure we soaked all the way through that playmate film. It were horrible. And then every five minutes we were shocked, watching our sisters strike every time Elvis kissed a girl. And all songs were proper soft for girly and that. At the end, they sang the Hawaiian wedding, so Hawaiian wedding song. And we couldn't hear the words, but went to striking. <laughs> Somehow we managed to put up with it till the end. And we managed to watch that film all the way through, I'll never know. Then our sisters dragged us back home. I was miserable for a week. I couldn't tell my mates what I'd watched and I thought I'd gone soft. It was a Jesse or something. Then two weeks later, I found out the guns of Navarone was being shown at the Prince's. So we went down to watch it. It was exciting. And when fighting started, all the young lads were jumping up and down, all chairs, shouting, cheering, and all of a sudden, the picture stopped. Then the lights came on, and the man here said, If you won't do anything like this again, I'll shut down the theatre. <laughs> well, we were quiet for at least five minutes. <laughs> Then English commandos started fighting Germans again. Well, everybody was up. 
We're up on six cheering, fighting it down, making noises like dummy guns. <laughs> Jumping up and down on seats. Once again, the lads went up and the manager ordered all the young lads out, apart from them with the dads. And we were all pushed unceremoniously into the street, crying and moaning and begging to be let back in. But to no avail, we were all thrown up and pushed out, out into the street. Me and I, Jack, once more had faces like two smack bottoms, sulking all the way home. I got home and told my mum what had happened. He, she went crackers. I thought, that manager's in for it now. I was wrong again. My mum gave me a good hard in for upsetting manager. <laughs> Then in a big gruff voice she bawled, that's it my lad, you can't go to ABC Manor on Saturday morning, not till you learn to behave yourself, and stop that bloody striking or I'll give you something to strike about. <laughs> I never get, did get to see Guns and Abra one, and I don't think I got did all. Thank you. Now this is a, a poem, uh, we, uh, we had a, a, a walk around uh, King Street with Ian Miller, uh, you were there Paul weren't you, where's he gone? So, yeah. ah, these glasses should have gone spec service. <laughs> and uh, it, it, very interesting guy, he, he did the talk on Cockium, it, for those who don't know me, it, is Oxford University North, a uh, chief archaeologist. And uh, we had a walk around and uh, we were looking above the skyline. And it, it inspired, inspired that. I, I wrote it a bit back, but I've included it into the, uh, the King Street collection. It's called King, King Street Skyline. As you walk down King Street, the shop fronts hit your eyes. No thought of neatness in those gaudy signs. Old doors. Hardly been opened or closed in all these years. The urban decay we witness could bring some people to tears. You look at the skyline above the cheap bar signs, architecture on display from all those far off times. The Georgian, the Victorian, standing proudly side by side, all commissioned by tradesmen who worked with civic pride. Look closer at the flora, the shrubs and the roots, sprouting up everywhere from the gutters and the roofs. People stir in dismay and they say, it's criminal neglect. The top floors will cave in soon, on that they'll place a bet. Some of the remaining buildings of long, long ago, overwhelmed by vermin, they face a death long and slow. Windows broken by you, hurling bricks, rocks and stones. They seem good kids, the mums will say, they're all trouble when they're home. Listed high-rise pigeon lofts, breeding squalor and disease. The cooing, flapping rock does enter buildings with such cheese. The upper floors of buildings, they soon will rot away, broken windows not attended to, deteriorate every day. Do they want the buildings unsafe, pulled down for building land? Powers of Victorian and rubble, where fine houses used to stand. We cannot let it happen, and we all hope and pray that our King Street will once more rise up and see a brand new day. Thank you. Do you want me to carry on or do you want to come for break? No, I'm easy, you can't get it on. This is a story about the Minorca. Not the island. That, that pub on corner of King Street. Uh, I don't know if you'd know uh, Martin Cruz Smith, but he, he had a, a fantastic book which in, I think it was 1981 when it was uh, put on, on the big screen in 1983. It uh, concerned, uh, I think his name was Arkady Renko, uh, a Moscow homicide detective. It, it, it got Oscars, it got bestseller, and he also wrote one called Rose. And uh, this is about that. And it's got a real amazing wigging connection. It was a barney and a summer. Oh, sorry, it's out again. 
in the balmy Andalusian autumnal Sunday, in the magical city of Granada. I had just finished breakfast and I went to have a read in the quiet, narrow streets of the beautiful medieval city. I was on the last chapter and soon finished the exciting finale to the Jack Reacher novel. I had noticed there was a swap bookshelf in the auto reception area. I went for a prize, very sorry, and my eyes caught sight of a book by the best selling author, Martin Cruz Smith. I knew his work since uh, reading Gorky Park, which was a 1981 crime thriller set in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. It featured the tough, uncompromising character, Arkady Renko, a Moscow homicide investigator, and it was released as a movie in 1983, starring William Hood and Lee Marvin. I picked up the book with interest. It was called Rose. I glanced at the back cover synopsis, and it read, the year is 1872. The place is Wigan, Northern England. A coal town where rich mine owners live lavishly alongside miners who are little better than slaves. Into this dark, complicated world comes Jonathan Blow, who has accepted a commission to find a missing man. When he begins his search, every road leads back to one woman, a haughty, vixenish pit girl named Rose. With her fiery hair and her skirt spindle spin over her trousers, she cares nothing for a society that calls her unnatural, scandalous, erotic. I reckon that slur was fired by jealousy because I felt hook, line, and sinker in love with this vivacious character. I was captivated when at the top of 28, Mr. Blur, the story's hero, had booked into the Minorca Hotel at the top of King Street. My thoughts were disturbed as my wife Liz and our friends, Jonathan Andrew, came down the stairs into the foyer. It was time to go to the legendary Alhambra, the palace and citadel in the, of the Sultanate of Murray, Spain. The citadel was upon the crest of the hill, as citadels very often are. So I put the book in my haversack and we went for a quick Estrella Dorado Cerveza to fortify us against the darting incline. As we were finishing the exceedingly good beer, a tourist bus around. A tourist bus pulled up outside. Not being proud, we piled on and paid the four euros and reached the summit in relative comfort. The Alhambra lived up to its billing. I just up over the bootwood. I tried to think of an answer to why an American author would write a book set in Victorian Wigan. And then I thought, I've just finished a Lee Charles book, so why would a Birmingham lad, who, Birmingham lad who lived in Salford and worked for Granada TV write American Secret Service and Crown novels? I said to myself, Ken, stop asking stupid questions. <laughs> On returning to Wigan, I decided to get stuck into Cruz Smith's book. But above all, the thing that intrigued, intrigued me most was the Minarca Hotel. It was Mr. Blur's home, his bed, his kitchen. It was a public house that over the years had been regularly visited by my family. My eldest sister Margaret loved the trendy stable bar. The upstairs Bernie and steak bar was a hit with courting couples as well. The first thing I did when I got back to Wigan was go for a pint bar. And on that note... <laughs> I need a garden. Uh, on returning to Wigan, I decided to get stuck into Ruth Luke. I've read that, haven't I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the Bernie State Bar. So when I got back to Wigan, I was to go for a pint bar. To my shock, it was called the Barclay Square with no real ale. I thought about the Nightingales. The reference to Nightingales being the song. A Nightingale sang in Barclay Square. It was a simple sentimental love song that recounts the circumstances of the first meeting of two lovers in Barclay Square, which was in Mayfair, London. The song was originally sung by Elsa Carlisle. In 1940, she recorded this atmospheric composition. Hers remains one of the memorable early versions of the piece, which was also covered by Dan Beaverlin. I mainly did try to see a Nightingale singing, but I had to be content with two scruffy looking pigeons coughing in the diesel fumes. <laughs> I enjoyed the Barclay, and to be honest, the pint of lager was crisp and clear. It went down well. The decor was quite tasteful. Unfortunately, its previous name was Blurs. 
Every time I thought of it, all I could see was Lionel tap dancing across the telly on a Saturday variety show with his top hat and twirling a cane. I would try and block him into my arm. Oh no, oh, Tony, Tony would. Telling lies on news now. You could always tell when he was lying, his lips were moving. <laughs> and I got up with the ever changed it to Boris's, that's all I can say. And what grasped me up the most is that I'm sure somewhere it still says that my marker on the wall. But in Wigan, we're full of tricks like that. Across the road, the pub has a sign above the top window. It says Clarence Hotel against the red Accrington brick. One foot above the door, in semi permanent hardboard, it says Harry's Bar. <laughs> then in Hallgate, we have a beautiful red Accrington brick pub, and across the door, in red Accrington brick, it says the All Saints Tavern. All Saints being the uh, iconic parish church of Wigan across the road. But lo and behold, on the wall in period plywood, it states the Anvil. I think that's what they call marketing or something. Anyway, a bit of history should come next. The Menorca is one of the few landmark buildings that haven't changed much over 200 years. In 1791, there was an inn owned by William Roper. It was Mr. Roper who was a partner in the creation of King Street from Faggy Lane. The pub was positioned on the corner of the new King Street. And Wargate, which was a main road into Wigan. The position was perfect for a tavern. It was rebuilt in the Georgian style about 1830. Many of its original features remain. It also kept the same name for nigh on 200 years, which was the Menorca Hotel. The origins of the name are not fully understood, but it is believed to have been run by a Spanish refugee from the Napoleonic Wars. Others say a bulk sea captain who served under Nelson in the Bellyric Island gave it its name. Actually, no one knows, but it makes a good talking point after an hour. It was in the early Victorian period that the railways had arrived, and the later building of two mainland stations within 30 yards of the front door would have helped the end to develop and prosper as a hotel. They were Wigan Northwestern serving Warrington and Preston, Wigan Walgate serving Manchester, Bolton, Liverpool, and Southport. The Menorca, like all old hostelries, also had paranormal guests as frequent visitors. The Menorca was listed as a haunted house in the 1985, 1985 book Lancashire's Ghosts and Legends by Terence Whitaker. The licensees, John and Vicky Ambrose, spoke to the local press on a number of incidents at the pub, such as cold spots in certain areas. The dog refused to go in certain rooms. Furniture moved itself around. But the most puzzling manifestation was pipe pots filling themselves when the pumps were switched off. It appears the poor ghosts had acquired the necessary skills for pumping ale, but indeed had not mastered the se secret art of posthumously drinking it. <laughs> and that's ghost for you. Anyway, the stone lined carriage archway leading to the stable yard is still an impressive feature on King Street, indicating the inn was a coaching house in days gone by. When the coach trade diminished with the advent of rail travel, the Menorca still had a coach house service. The shop front became the Menorca Grill Room, which was a walk-in restaurant. There was a separate ladies' tea room, which was upstairs and had an entrance in the corner in Row Bottom Square, which is still there. Also, to boost trade was King Street becoming the financial and legal sector centre of the ancient and lion town. It's more than likely some important deals and some shady deals were made in the dark recesses of the bar after five to two of McGee's idea. Then King Street progressed from being just commerce land to theatre land, with four theatres at one time. It was a hub of entertainment in Wigan. It really was the king of the streets. The highest paid entertainers in the country played the theatres regularly. They played to packed audiences who enjoyed the shows, but a seismic shift in technology and the Second World War started the decline. The opening shots of the new technologies were Hollywood movies, first in black and white, then dazzling technicolor. Variety shows gradually switched to television, and the music all declined and switched to cinemas. It was a gradual shift in technology and social attitudes and conventions, well, probably developed over 50 years, which in the main changed the social mindset of the population. 
Anyway, I've just had a road to Damascus moment. Or was it a Eureka, an Archimedes moment? The hero of the novel rose was Jonathan Blur. The Menorca was his home for the time he spent on the case in Wigan, such as for Mr. Maypole. The pub's name changed to Blur's in the 1980s, so it would well have been named in honour of the main male character in the novel, who was a certain Jonathan Blur. A fitting tribute to a book extolling the, tra the traditions of our little town, but wait, when was the book written? It was Blur's in the late 80s and early 90s. Then it could have been named in honour of the character Jonathan Blur. Then I realised the book was only released in America in 1996. Then it cannot be in honour of Jonathan Blur. So with the flame and it was Blur. Okay. Right. This is all doing me, I didn't. I go for a party in Menorca, or is it the Barclays World? I'm here now. Bounce a Peroni, please, look. And the McGee's RPA, RPA for the ghost. The poor last looked at me with a puzzled expression. Thank you. Uh, Rose is still available on Amazon. I think that's probably the only place you'll get it now. I think it's actually different. Uh, this is a song, I'm sorry, a story, a poem, in fact, of a fella called Walford Brody. He styled himself as a doctor of medicine. <laughs> Walford Brody, MD. I'll just put some notes up about him. He had a unique act, which was electrocuting the audience. He <laughs> was a hypnotist, ventriloquist, and an electrocutionist, <laughs> if there's such a thing. He actually electrocuted people as a comedy routine, and he was a top dog, top dog on the national musical scene. And I, probably, I was thinking about it, I, I couldn't find any scripts or anything what to do with him, but I think he must have been a cross between Professor Magnus Pike and Tommy Cooper. Anyway, this is all about him. Watford brought it. MD, it was very right. No wonder electrocuting himself every night. It was a showman, charlatan, a con man, they said. But they still flocked to see him, and his lovely maid. Her name was Belle Electra, so she claimed. She assisted Walford Brody through his fun and his games. He had a little spark in her, the kiss on the lips, and the roast of an end. With the audience in fits. Through the music halls of Britain, they took the show. Electricity, magnetism, hypnotism, wonders galore, reanimating animal bodies with electrical current, electrical current. The audience gasped in horror, awe, and amazement. He excelled at ventriloquism, throwing his voice. He hypnotized people to do things of his choice. Were they a con man, charlatan, crook, or a quack? It was a top entertainer, I hope we'll be back. To the Theatre of Oriel on Wiggins King Street, where many talented performers give us a treat. Treading the boards, they fill our faces with smiles. It's fun for all, the best entertainment for miles. Thank you. <laughs> I think you might have gathered they didn't have better than safety in them days. <laughs> right, this, this is a memoir. I, I, I was struggling to get a, I mean, over there, there's Tom over there, he's some, Tom Lopes, some fantastic research, Jim being over there, and Neil, Neil and Freddie, he, he's done, there's, there's some people doing some great research, but sometimes it's only a paragraph in The Guardian in 1862, what we can find, so then you have to create characters and start to keep and do things like this, but I, I was really struggling for some inspiration, so I had a walk down King Street. And this is the real old. I was walking down Wiggins King Street. I was perusing the buildings looking for inspiration. I'd already discovered many of the street's iconic buildings and interesting historical events over the past. When I found myself outside the horrific 1960s edifice, Broke Loose, occupying the old house numbers 71 to 73, I looked at the abomination with horror. 
and my eyes looked around with a touch of sadness at the multi-lane highway that once was Chapel Lane and the sad remnants of the western edge of Darlington Street. My mind drifted back to when I was in my twenties. On that spot once stood the lovely old Teddy Walker's book, The Derby Arms. I remember it well, with its textured velvety wallpaper, or should I say wall coverings. A beautifully polished, ornately carved outward bar with its wood and brass hand pumps in bags of three, standing there like wickets, awaiting anything that a fast bowler could hurl at them. Primed and ready to pump out frothing, fl- frothing flagons of Joshua Tetley's finest. The regulars were a friendly bunch. The pub was full of characters, but I wouldn't have dared to cross them. And we did like to call into the derby for an early Saturday evening pint or Sunday afternoon on, on the way to the rugby. It was a traditional pub of character, sadly demolished in 1983 to make way for the inner ring road. If I remember co- correctly, there was a barber next door. I was at the hairdressers. Could have been both. With my shiny dome, I haven't needed one of them establishments for 32 years. It was then when I treated myself to a hair trimmer and demolished my comb over. There was a photography shop and a framing service. It might have been tailors. And then a corset shop. I was in a wedding shop. I think they had corsets in windows, so it could have been either. Across the road was a pet shop, and suddenly my mind flashed back to the 60s. Loads of kids walking up King Street in World War II tin hats and gas masks with khaki gas mask bags over their shoulders. It was K's Army Surplus Stores. And on his cave, I've only tackled to out an ex force is rubbish. You should have seen my mum's face when I proudly walked in the house showing off my new purchases. She went crackers. You can get them flaming things off for a start. Where did you get them from? Kay's boutique, I whimpered. <laughs> How much did you pay from? Far Bob, I said, looking sternly at my feet. I'm not giving you pocket money to waste on rubbish. You're getting on for two weeks. You know, get in your bedroom and read a book because you're not watching telly, are you? After a few days sulking, I found him in the shed and went playing army with the lads roaming over the fields and woods between Shevington and Standish. And by the way, did you know, Standish is a corruption of St. Andish, a 10th century holy man who came over to Lancashire with the Vikings. It didn't want to, but the buggers had nailed him to front of shit. <laughs> anyway, that's just one of the, the great Harry Penton's quips. Caves became an important thing to me as a young teenager. I saw myself as a bit of a mod. I had a Lambretta LI-150 Series 2. This mode of transport was generally referred to by the local rockers as a bean can or a puff's chariot. In the chilly winter, we would flock to case for ex-NATO parkers or military officers' great coats. The RAF ones were most sought after. They are much more style than the Army or the Navy ones. We also got Army boots for work. If you could get rubber sold or on nail, the cheapest in Wigan and far, far, by and far the best. If you were stuck for something, you could always find a cheaper alternative with Kays. When I think about Kays, my mind drifts back once more to the super Wigan comic, Harry Pemberton. When Harry was telling his schools and early books jokes, it, it would relate. My mum got my school uniform from Kays. I did my third year at St. Pat's as a German corporal. <laughs> And in case we could also get a fishing tackle cheap. I once got to make your own fishing rod kit. It was an air reel from a tank. <laughs> and you got the line eyes for the rod and twine to bound them on, cork rings to make an handle, and aluminium rings to hold the reel onto the handle. I have to admit, it was about as useful as the chocolate fire guard, but it kept me quiet for a while. <laughs> Next to Kay's was the Mandarin House Chinese Restaurant. It was fondly nicknamed Mix, named after the proprietor. It previously ran the Chinese restaurant downstairs in the King of Clubs on King Street. I have to watch out to make sure I don't name anyone in this bit. King of Clubs. And the restaurant was in what used to be the, be the beer keller. The customers struggled with his name and christened him Mick and the name stuck. It was a nice bloke and he always presented the food well. It always went down well and not too pricey. 
After a while, the downstairs restaurant in the King of Clubs began to make a loss. There were too many competitors for letting out food in the town and the King of Clubs was losing its everywhere. So the restaurant was closed. If my memory serves me right, it became Leo's nightclub. The deli in the restaurant was next door but one on the other side of Kays. Although I have already covered it in a previous story, I, I will give it a mention. It had the nickname Sweaty Betches, and uh, they bought the Happy Palace restaurant on Market, Marketplace when they heard about the town centre redevelopment. They moved well before the demol demolition of Darlington Street West and continued trade until 1985 when they retired. The Santi Bank filled the void left by the demise of the deli. As I gazed on the modern multi lane crossroads and soulless block that is Buckleys, the improvised car park that once was the town on, seemingly demolished by accident, there was sadness in my eyes. Business is gone, building lost, old friends passed on. I kept trying to remember exactly where everything stood. I thought back at here then. I looked up King Street. The Royal Court Theatre was under renovation. The old buildings that can still be served. The iconic Ramsey's Arcade boarded up due to be renovated. And once again, I feel with hope that King Street will rise again. Thank you. Uh, I was uh, I'm not doing that, I'm doing I'm pulling this one in. Uh, I'm doing it in a minute, so uh, I used to do some volunteering for some shire house just after I retired in 2018 and I, I was going I was driving into uh, around the uh, you know when you come off the main road and you're doubling back on yourself to head for scones. Uh, and there was nothing there. The facade of the uh, town hall had gone, and that was supposed to be saved and repurposed. So, in a fit of peak and sorrow, I, uh, I wrote this one. As I turned left into King Street, I felt forlorn. There was nothing left of the old town hall, just a wide open space full of dust and rubble. I was shocked indeed. My mind was troubled. The facade will be kept, that's what we were told. The form and fabric of the town is worth gold more than gold. The once proud semicircular facade has now been consigned to history's graveyard. Back at home, I have a prized possession because kept collecting memorabilia. Sorry, collecting memorabilia is my obsession. A copy of a sports postcard from 1905, an era when Kick Street was really alive. With ladies in finery, a horse, and a carriage. I never thought that I would see such damage. The excuse did, given, it was demolished in error. The remaining buildings I looked at with terror. They said the facade would be treated with care. Now it's just bound for a long fun somewhere. I looked at his sister across from this street. Once the Italian style quadrant building all neat and neat. It, that's now reduced to a soulless shell in the mid 60s style, a vision of hell. It was later revealed the facade was unsafe. Another beautiful building, just remembered in tales. Thank you. Yeah. I went through to sink. I missed this. I wrote this after walking up from walking up from Wigan Central to John Bull. And King Street was happening up and he had a look down and but he had music coming through and all fashions. So I wrote this. And then I thought, this will do well as, as a rap. So if you could give a little rhythm. So one, two, three, four, one, two. Yeah, keep it going. Walking through Wigan in the fading light. Young lashes are out on a Saturday night. On the street full of clubs. Full of bars, cotton up and taxes in the private cars. Young women in minis and the old cut tops, knocking back the shots and the alcohol boxes, just to dance to the sound of MC, house music, rap and the R&B. Some guys roaming thinking fighting is good, 
Då men bortsett mot den lyckligt in the boat. Both of them all the security stuff. They'd rather calm it down, let them have a good luck. From club to bar and bar to club, nipping to build to a kebab shop, you need some grub. Expensive taste, no time for real. All the girls want is posh cocktails. It's five in the morning, things are falling down. Fast food rappers blow around the town. Girls carry the reels and the rifles they have they search for taxes, the door it breaks. Thank you. Now, um, all the son's very own Stan Laurel. He played Wigan many times, either with uh, Dan Lino's uh, troupe or uh, Fred Carnell's uh, circus or later on. And uh, he went over to uh, America on the same boat as Charlie Chaplin, who incidentally uh, copied George Formby Sr.'s uh, character, John Willie. With the baller hat, baggy jacket, baggy pants, uh, boot, boots too big for him on wrong feet, and a cane. Uh, he, he perfected the moves, what John, uh, what George Farmer did, and uh, then he uh, he did them in his vaudeville act, and they became the tramp in the Charlie, Charlie Chaplin silence. And uh, every time he watched a silent film, George Farmer. It must have been then, yes, he'd been a little bugger, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> what what being Carnival's circus was rubbish. But Stan did the vaudeville for a few more years and uh, he managed to make it in slapstick, slapstick comedy in the, in the silence in 1917. And then he teamed up with Oliver Hardy and the rest of the days. And he came back to King Street in the cinemas with Way Out West released in 1938. On a mountain in Virginia stands a lonesome pine. Just below there's a cabin home of a little girl of mine. Her name is June and very, very soon She'll belong to me For I know she's waiting there for me Neath that lone pine tree And singing's compulsory In the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia On the trail of a lonesome pine In the pale moonshine To hearts and twine Where she carved a name And I carved mine Oh June like those mountains and blue like the pine I sure am pounding for you In the Blue Ridge Mountains The mountains of Virginia On the trail of a lonesome pine And you want to word this much? I can hear the tinkling waterfall High amongst the hills High above a twittering bluebird sings Fills the air with rapturous trills He seems to say his tune is lonesome too Sorrow fills his eyes But he knows she's waiting there for him Where the pine tree sighs Last time in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia on the trail of a lonesome pine In the pale moonshine To hearts and twine Where she carved a name And I carved mine Oh June, oh June Like the mountains I'm blue like the pine I sure I'm pining for you In the blue ridge Mountains of Virginia On the trail of the autumn pine Thank you Have any questions on uh, what I've been up to on this stage? Uh, uh, any of the historical things or any of the way my crazy mind works? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know what questions we can ask. Uh, can we? How did you get so daft? 
<laughs> well, anyway, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure <laughs> doing, doing my own work uh, in Frontier, and, uh, and a lot of it, it wouldn't have been possible without... Uh, Tom did some lo lovely work called Thorley Smith, and I, I, when I did my King Street West, I, I, I used quite a bit of that. I know Neil's worked tirelessly, Neil Lidford over there, and Jim Meehan over there, and without what they've started, I wouldn't have had the inspiration. So the, the, there will be uh, something like 15 short stories and 15 <coughs> poems by the time it's due for publication. So please buy some. It's it's a light-hearted look at history and there's some lovely stuff. And thanks very much for having me. Uh, do you not think that Blair's might have come from George Blair? Well, I don't I don't know George Blair, so enlighten me. Uh, Eric Blair, sorry, Eric Blair. Eric Blair. George Orwell. George Orwell. Oh, I never thought about him. Well, I'm leaving him out because a lot of people don't like uh, his depiction of Wigan. I mean, I, I thought his uh, Road to Wigan back was showing Wigan. It, it picked Wigan because it was a microcosm of uh, pit, canal, rail, uh, cotton, coal, and steel because there was a massive steel works in it. So, rabbit rocks uh, were um, actually built. The, they were caused by steel spike, molten steel spike like being pumped. We dumped from the steel works. So he had everything under one roof. So if you want to get a, a picture of the north of England industrial areas, you're going to want to live in Wigan at once within walking distance. So it's because of that fact it was used, but some people don't like the way it treated Wigan. So I forget his head up. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much, Dr. Belkin. Thank you.